Disorders of sexual development have often been considered as a medical and a social emergency. But what's been often ignored that it is actually an emergency for the doctors who rush towards going to the books with the various things as to how to evaluate an individual with DSD. IDSD will focus on the entire aspects of the sorosexual sexual differentiation ranging from pathophysiology to classification to evaluation and management to IDSD which is going to focus about disorders of sexual de development which is a very intriguing topic a very interesting topic which is often causing a lot of confusion with regards to evaluation and management website learning.growsociety.in which from which we are webcasting this event where we have got multiple options available for learning in the form of our master pediatric endocrine course over 18 months covering nearly now 100 modules on everything related to pediatric endocrinology so if you want to learn you've got each and every aspect which is there using videos using text pre-test case scenarios and everything available we have recently launched a pediatric endocrinology for postgraduate program which again is covering a number of learning modules specifically for postgraduates for a three-year period all of you can have a look at a book which is available and along with that there we have the mobile application basically which is covering in that perspective the various aspects of management of pediatric endocrine disorders including the approach pathway the management pathway the personalized management care and there are various ways you can use it's a very intuitive form in terms of evaluating patients with different disorders of pediatric endocrinology and these are available on Android and iOS. So the key questions which a child with DSD is asking you is, how do you stabilize the child? What would be the gender of rearing? Is there a role of gonadectomy or not? And what are the long-term management which happens? So initially you have to stabilize the child, look for pointers of CH. If there is a non-palpable gonad, that is an emergency. If there is a XY with low testo, and no uterus, again, think of some rarer male variant CH, what we speak, evaluation, do a 17 OHP, electrolytes, and manage with steroid replacement and fluid boluses as required. Counseling, very important, has to be comprehensive, talk about pathophysiology, long-term issues, fertility, sexuality, contextual assessment, so every culture will have a different expectation, don't try to break those barriers very quickly, and don't be over paternalistic in that regards it should be open-ending and non-prescriptive in that regards Involvement, uh, managing the emergency conditions to gender assignment to uh, uh, associated complication management and a long-term follow-up and outcome so now i'll be talking about gender assignment this is a most imp uh, very important and a challenging decision to do in a patients with dsd so uh, if we look at the history of DSD and the evolu uh, evolution of the technology uh, treatment or the healthcare provided to the patients with DSD, we can see that gender assignment has changed over a long, uh, over a fundamental time, over this time, fundamentally. Initially, uh, the assignment of gender was based on the gonadal tissue that was present. Later then, uh, it was uh, switched over to the carrier type. On, and on the basis of karyotype, gender assignment was done. Later, in the, with more understanding, they switched over to the ability to create a surgically functional gonad or uh, genitals. After this, uh, is, uh, this was till 2006 when the consensus guideline came uh, surgery. for the DSG. Yes, sir. Can you just keep it a bit closer, the mic? The volume is a bit less. Here. Okay, sir. Is it now okay, sir? Much better, much better. Yes, sir. So after 2006, when the consensus guideline for DSD evolved, uh, there have been a lot many changes and better understanding of patients' gender uh, uh, with DSDs. So uh, now the gender assignment is not only based on the gonads or the sexual appearance, it depends and it involves multiple factors. The multiple factors that, are, that play a role in gender assignment are gender identity, Gender identity is basically uh, uh, the per how the person identifies himself, whether as a male or a girl. And it is most important factor that has to be considered when assigning a gender. But it is not at birth, uh, it is very difficult to predict the gender identity of the person. But various other factors can help in identify, uh, help in supporting the gender identity, which we will be talking in the next slide. 
the other important factors that need to be considered are the social or so- societal norms the fertility outcomes and the sexual orientation of the person in addition to that one also needs to understand that uh, antenatal androgen exposure has effect on the brain programming as well as it can cause virilization of the child and depending on the virilization and the programming of the brain one may need to assign gender properly various social and cultural norms or cultural issues may be uh, of the particular region also play important role in gender assignment and if not finally a uh, surgical outcome is also important because some surgeries may be possible and some may not be possible so considering all these factors what is the best gender that can be assigned to the child is important this is very important so as when we assign a gender to a child he is being reared as that gender and it should not later create some gender dysphoria in this child when he goes into puberty so just let's talk about gender identity in brief as we all know gender identity uh, as described is like whether the person identifies himself as a male or a female so gender identity depends on various factors or various factors have a influence on the gender of the patient one of the most important is the karyotypes a uh, presence of y chromosome does have a influence on gender identity of the person our brain structure is a dimorphic structure and depending on the various hormonal exposures and genetic exposures it can develop into different types and have different identities the uh, other important factor that can contribute to gender identity is the fetal environment androgen exposure in the antenatal period can also prog- uh, affect our brain programming and can cause different gender identity as well and last but not the least is the postnatal outcome how the child is reared what are the cultural norms that are followed all these things define the gender identity of the child so after discussing what is gender identity now we will dis- uh, discuss individual cases in detail and how should we uh, help the child or help the parents in assigning the gender this is not like if it's a 100% rule but it will help us guide in the management of treatment so first coming to the most common form of dsd that is a xx dsd a 21 hydroxylase deficiency in this cases we all know that there is a defect in 21 hydroxylase which prevents formation of cortisol and androsterone and results in excess of androgens so why we know that the child has been exposed to androgens in the intra intra in life which causes a my virilization and depending on the virilization we can grade them according to the prader staging in this child most of the times considering the fertility aspects and the sexual aspects uh, gender of rearing may be considered as female the rarely these patients do have gender identity issues so and mostly i'm not saying 100% but mostly in the xx dsd patients at birth the gender of rearing may be used as a female uh, but after proper discussion with the parents and one should not be in a hurry to do surgery surgery is recommended only in those children who have prader stage 3 and more of virilization and the surgery involves vaginal mobilization so as to have a functional uh, functionality so let's talk about the surgery as we discussed previously the indication for surgery is only prior when the child has virilization of prader stage 3 to stage 5 the timing of the surgery depends on uh, if the gender of assignment uh, uh, gender has been decided if it is clear in the early stages that the child is going to be reared as female and the diagnosis is confirmed in that cases surgery can be done early as it can help prevent uh, recurrent vaginal sinus infections due to a common pathway between the uterus and the urinary bladder Uh, the procedure that in uh, is done in this patients is vaginal mobiliz- mobilization clitoral reduction surgery should not be done or should be avoided as it can damage the neuromuscular tissues and one should when after doing this surgery also one should keep uh, assessing this children and they should have been controlled properly with medication so that they do not develop any gonadal adrenal rest which can again produce uh, androgens and cause further virilization in this child so one needs to be very uh, meticulous in monitoring these patients and having a proper compliance with treatment 
in some uh, situations or very rare situations when the child with 21 hydroxylase deficiency presents at a later age like during puberty with cyclical hematuria who has been reared as male or when they have severe virilization or when there are cultural issues where parents prefer to raise the child as a male in that cases we can have a we can consider as a gender of rearing as male in this patients when we consider them to be reared as male a gonadectomy and hysterectomy can be planned accordingly moving ahead to the xy steroidogenic defects uh, all the defects below uh, about to about the lhcg receptor will not have any effect of androgens over the brain so in the antenatal period in the defects like side chain cleavage or star di uh, dihydrocholesterol defects or 3 beta hsd the gender identity will depend on uh, uh, antenatal androgen exposure in this patient since there will be no antenatal androgen exposure the gender of rearing can be uh, mostly as a female and also one needs to consider that since this patients uh, do not have androgens their gonads or the testes will be high up in the abdomen and this will predispose a, predispose them to high risk of malignancy hence gonadectomy is advised in these patients considering all these factors they may be reared as females the defects below lhcg receptor like the 17 beta hydroxy steroid defect uh, in which androstenedione is converted to testosterone in this the gender assignment depends on the androgen exposure in the intrauterine life and the amount of virilization since androstenedione can be converted peripherally in testosterone so some androgen exposure will be present in these children and hence it will be a guiding uh, factor in these patients if the gender of rearing is considered as male one can give a trial of uh, testosterone injections and a corrective surgeries may be done at 6 months to 18 months for repair of penoscrotal hypospadiasis if any if the gender of rearing is unclear one should defer the surgeries and till that time one can use gnrh analogs till one is clear about the gender of rearing the gonadal risk in 17 beta hst defects is intermediate since the gonads are at the deep inguinal ring and in this cases if a patient is considered to be reared as male in that cases one can do a cardiopexy with proper monitoring of this patients for the risk of malignancy coming to the next defect that is a 5 alpha reductase 2 defect in this uh, we know that the defect is in conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone so testosterone is present in the antenatal life as well and hence they are exposed to androgens in the antenatal period and uh, there is some amount of virilization as well so in patients most of the times the gender of rearing is male and a testosterone injection uh, can be given in the infancy with corrective surgery is done at 6 to 18 months of age when the gender of assignment is uh, when the gender is considered as male uh if unclear depending on the virilization if the child is very under virilized one may defer the surgery until that time one can use gnrh analogs the risk of malignancy in this patients is in very less around 3 to 5% so one can do or cardiopexy in this patients and for frequent monitoring for gonadal malignancy is important now uh going to complete androgen insensitivity syndromes in the since there is complete androgen insensitivity there is no antenatal exposure to androgens and hence the gender identity most commonly in this patients is female since the gonads are present at the deep inguinal ring in this patients the risk of malignancy in the prepubertal child is very less but the risk after puberty increases to around 10% and hence it is recommended that one should defer gonadectomy till puberty or till complete sexual development has been achieved uh, and one should keep monitoring the gonads and if needed a repeat biopsy should be done to see for the intra uh, some intratubular changes or intraluminal changes in patients with partial androgen uh, insensitivity syndrome it uh, the gender identity is variable many cases of gender dysphoria have been observed in this patients as the as there is variable exposure to androgens in the intrauterine life 
uh, one can also see that how they respond to testosterone if there is a good response present one may uh, think of if uh, gender of rearing of his male and one may delay surgery still it is clear the risk of malignancy is also very high in these patients if the gonads are abdominal the risk is around 50% and if it is scrotal the risk is less than 30% but is on the higher side in these cases orchidopexy should be done in infancy and monitoring is very important and were repeated ultrasounds and biopsy if needed should be done in the post pubertal age now going to the next important topic is xy gonadal dysgenesis as we have discussed the various genes involved in development of gonads can be affected and can cause xy gonadal dysgenesis so in this cases the gender identity depends on the virilization or androgen exposure if it is there most of the times this patients identify themselves as male and respond with testosterone uh, and uh, can be treated with testosterone if there is any hypospadias one can repair it around 6 to 15 months of age in females if the patient identifies himself or herself as female the surgical prospect is difficult uh, because creating a vaginal opening will be difficult in this patients the risk of gonadal malignancies is very high in this child about 30% uh, if the defects are in nr5a1 and wt1 and in there is abdominal gonads and gonadectomy is indicated in this children at the earliest in children who have x x y dsds or mixed gonadal dysgenesis the gender identity it also again depends on the androgen exposure which is the predominant component whether x or x y and how much is the androgen exposure and virilization most of them identify themselves as male and depending on the sex of rearing we may have to look uh, and decide about the further management the gonadal malignancy risk is about 30% in this patients and even those who have scrotal testes should undergo frequent biopsy to assess the risk of gonadal malignancies uh, as they have uh, uh, gonad uh, x x y chimerism these gonads may become streak and have to be removed by around 10 years of age as the risk significantly increases after 10 years in patients with over testicular dsds gender identity is variable and it can be flexible and one should delay surgery in this cases till the we can be able we will be able to talk with the child understand his prospect and the risk of gonadal uh, malignancies is around 2 to 5% if the child is considered to be rear, uh, is reared as male one can remove the ovarian component of the over testicular tissue and the testicular tissue that is remaining needs to be monitored frequently for uh, needs to be monitored frequently for any gonadal malignancy risk if the child is to be reared as female one may remove the over testes and supplement her with the hormones when needed at puberty asking about uh... the uh, for slo can we directly test for cholesterol level due to easy availability exactly and that's why lipid profile is extremely important if you look at our approach pathways for lipid profile we do talk about for the adrenal sufficiency we do talk about the lipid profile as an important test and that's extremely important in that regards dr akarichok is asking about a newborn presenting with ambiguous genitalia with, with ovaries and uterus having no androgen exposure and normal 17 ohp levels okay very interesting case this is basically a dsd with definite mullein structures there i am assume that there are no gonads so this looks like a xx dsd we have got normal 17 ohp so ch 21 hydroxyl is, is off 11 3 beta pur are unlikely no androgen exposure my first take would be aromatase deficiency to think of in that setting the second thing which i'll probably think of would be then would be gonadal dysgenesis so we have to do those genetic tests but before that aromatase would be the most likely situation in that regards dr deepa is asking from trishur regarding which all xy dsds can present with a pseudo vagina now what we need to understand is that what really is pseudo vagina when we say pseudo vagina it basically means that the mullein structures are not there so the the upper two thirds of the vagina is not developed the lower two third is there which basically means that if you have severe testosterone deficiency or resistance of any cause 
in which what we earlier used to call as sex reversal will present with pseudo vagina so if you have your complete androgen insensitivity syndrome they can present like that slo can present like that so anything where you have zero androgen effect they will present with that pseudo vagina so